Well, it's a blessing to be here. Um, uh, interesting night. <laughs> uh, a lot of specials and a lot of singing. It's been a blessing uh, this tonight. And uh, I, uh, I must be more, more of a wimp or whatever than all you guys because when you guys are shouting and running around, I'm crying my eyes out the back there. So this guy... This brother's singing about a lighthouse and and all those songs he's singing and and uh, and uh, uh, no one ever cared for for me like Jesus. That's Brother Donovan's favorite song. He told us and he said every time they sing it in in church, he just sits down and cries the whole time. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Whew. You can run the bases on that one. You must be pretty manly. I sure can't, man. But. But it's a blessing being here. I want to thank everyone that came out, and uh, I want to thank the uh, workers, the ladies, and the uh, the men that cooked for us. And it was a real blessing. And uh, for Pastor Kim inviting me uh, back uh, to come here and uh, giving me the chance to preach, uh, I count it as a privilege. And uh, it's a real blessing to be here. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, this uh, story that I heard off of uh, Final Fight. And they, uh, there's this podcast called uh, Forgotten, and it talks about uh, Christians that aren't very well known, but they uh, served the Lord and they were faithful and they did uh, mighty things in the eyes of God, um, but weren't very well known. And there's a man, uh, his name is Kiyoshi Watanabe, and he was born in 1890 in Japan. Uh, his brother gave him a Bible that he read. And got saved from, uh, he got ended up getting saved from it at age 19. His brother, the one who gave him the Bible, ended up sadly dying without Christ. Wow. In 1950, he became a Lutheran pastor. A year later, he married uh, Shigairu and had two girls and one boy. The, the two girls, sadly, the two girls died of dysentery, and his wife died in childbirth wow. after their fifth child was born. Years later, he married a woman named Mitsuko. In 1942, he moved to Hong Kong to translate in the Japanese army. He was put into a prisoner camp to translate. And they talked about this prisoner camp, how uh, it was uh, very bad. Uh, the British soldiers would come in and, and the Japanese soldiers would treat them uh, like animals and just a lot of them were starving, a lot of them didn't have... Uh, the the, the uh, health care and, and uh, a lot of them were dying and this man Kiyoshi Watanabe uh, risked his life for the enemy uh, the British people were the Japanese enemies and he risked his life for these people and uh, these soldiers risked his life to give aid to his enemy and smuggled medicine into the camp to give to pr British prisoners the Lord protected him and he never got caught in all the years of the war. Wow. Tragedy struck when he learned that his wife, Mitsuko, and stepdaughter died from the atomic bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. Through all of this, what he went through, all the death he saw, and the, uh, he still served God, and he had this to say, I am his creature. I must do his will. He has been good to me. And who am I to question his will? If Mitsuko had to die in Miwa with her, it is not for Kiyoshi, Kiyoshi Watanabe to say why. Wow. Very faithful man that was faithful to serving God and uh, he uh, died serving the Lord. And uh, he uh, uh, has to do with my message because uh, Kiyoshi, uh, when he got saved and later on in life and it talked about uh, him going to a college and getting called to uh, be a preacher, uh, he found his calling. He found his purpose in life. And he kept that in the back of his mind. And tonight I'm going to be talking about, uh, about uh, your purpose in life and uh, what it is and what uh, we should be looking at for a purpose in our lives. Uh, if you could turn to the book of Esther, Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4, 
we'll look at a couple verses here. We'll be turning through uh, quite a bit of scripture, so you just try to keep up and uh, we'll uh, learn something from the Word of God. Esther chapter 4, and let me get, look at verse 13. Esther 4, verse 13. The Bible says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For thou all t- together holdest thy peace at this time. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity that we can open up your word of God and uh, be able to praise you through singing. Pray that you'll bless what is said, Lord. Bless the words that are said. Uh, I'm not worthy to be up here, Lord, but uh, I count it a privilege, Lord, and I pray you uh, clean my lips, Lord, and have me say what you want me to say, Lord, and just be a blessing, Lord, to these people and allow me to uh, give them something from your word, Lord, that they can uh, take it and use it to be a better soldier for you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, that's a pretty well-known uh, Baptist saying. A lot of uh, preachers like to say it. Uh, for such a time as this. And for such a time as this, we here are put in this time of 2020 in California. And the title of my message is a question. And the question is, why are you here? Why are you here? It's been asked by, uh, by people throughout all of creation, since the beginning of time, people have wondered with uh, the religious people and the non-religious people have wondered and tried to figure out what is the purpose of living here on earth. The evolutionist view, uh, they, they say, we are just a cosmic accident, the product of time and chance. And so that's why all the scientists go crazy and they, they have no purpose. They're just a cosmic accident. So why, why, why do anything in this, in this world it, for the good or for the bad if you're just a cosmic accident? A well-known scientist, Michael Shermer, he had this to say. He said, there is no higher purpose. It's left to us. We must create our purpose. That's the only meaning we have in this universe. When you got saved, when Jesus Christ saved you from a lake of fire, you got a purpose. You found the higher purpose. Yes, sir. He came to us as he was singing. Amen. He came to me. The, the Baptists love to say, oh, I found Jesus, I found Jesus, and, and all that, but no, Jesus found us. Yes. Amen. We, weren't even, we weren't even looking for him, as, as the song says. We were strangers, and he went after us. The 90 and 9, he went after us. And um, the scientists have it wrong. And here in this chapter, we know uh, we can't talk about the whole book, but most of us are familiar with the book of Esther. And so the king's wife uh, betrayed and, and went against the king. And so he got another wife and it ended up being Esther. And he loved Esther. He loved her, uh, loved her as his wife. And Haman was a wicked man. He was a type of antichrist. And... Mordecai, Esther's uncle, was the only one who wouldn't bow the knee to him as he, wa- and he, as he came through the streets. And Haman hated Mordecai, and he hated the Jews. And so Haman got with the king, and he made him sign this decree that it would eradicate all the Jews, kill them all. And here in these two verses, Mordecai has a great saying, a great charge to Esther, and he says, Hey, don't think you're going to get out of this. You're going to die too, Esther. If you don't do anything, you're going to die too. You're a Jew. And he said, you've come to this kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, you're here at this time to save the Jews. And we know the story. She had uh, two banquets with them. The, the Jews were praying and fasting for it. And the God, God uh, answered their request, and Haman ended up hanging on the same gallows that Mordecai was supposed to hang on. 
And Esther told the king that I'm a Jew and Haman wants to kill me. So they killed Haman. But for such a time as this, Esther was in that kingdom. And uh, let's, we're going to look at some, uh, I only have two points here, uh, but don't think it's going to be a short message because it's not. But, I mean, hey, if we could sing for two, three hours, we could preach for two, three hours, man. So, uh, we're going to look at two different things. First of all, we're going to look at the things that keep you from finding your purpose. The things that keep you from finding your purpose. We're going to look at some characters in the Bible that had a purpose in life and they failed. And the first one we're going to look at is Lucifer. Look over in uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 14. And look at verse 13. The Bible says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Because Lucifer was created, his main purpose on this earth, God created him to be a vessel of his glory, of God's glory. He created him to be a musical instrument to give praise to God. And before uh, Genesis 1-2 uh, and, the, and the gap there, there the sons of God uh, were praising God through Lucifer. They were praising God. And that was his, his purpose. But here we see that his pride, uh, he had pride and he wanted to go above God. And he said, I want that praise that the sons of God are giving to you. I want that praise. I want that glory. And he said, I will ascend above the, uh, above the north, the sides of the north. And look at verse 15. The Bible says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And because he wanted to ascend up to the north, he's brought, uh, God made him fall. And he fell because of his pride. And Lucifer wasn't able to fulfill his goal, fulfill his purpose because of his pride. And Christian, if you want to find your purpose, you're, you want to find the meaning of your life, your pro you have to put down your pride. You cannot have pride. The Bible says God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. He resisteth the proud. If you're going to be full of pride, you're not going to be able to find your, your main purpose. You're not going to be able to find it. And the pride, you, when you actually get the purpose, and when the Lord shows you, and you think you're something, you think you're something because you're a big name pastor, that's when you'll go down. Yeah. I'm not going to name them, but I know them. I know them. They're lifted up in pride. And they're going down. They're going down. They were once a good pastor, a good preacher, a Bible believer. And they got the pride. They got proud. And they're going down. You can't find your purpose if you're full of pride. Let's look at another character, um, Adam. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 14. The Bible says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so this is talking about how uh, you learn, in this verse you learn that Adam wasn't deceived. In Genesis 3 you don't learn, you just, he, just Eve takes the fruit and, and then she gives it to Adam and he takes of it. But here you learn that Adam was not deceived. He knew better. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he was going to lose a relationship with God. And I believe, and I believe Dr. Ruckman also taught that his love for Eve, that's why he, he fell. 
Because he realized he saw that she was different and she was changed and she was now a sinner. And, she, and he said to himself, I'm going to lose her. I'm going to live for eternity. I'm going to live forever. But she's going to die one day and I can't lose her. And his love for his wife, his love for Eve was more than the love for God. And he disobeyed God. And he fell. Adam's purpose, he was put in that garden to glorify God. It says he walked in the cool of the, of the, of the morning in the garden with, Jesus, with, with God and had great fellowship with him. And he named all the animals and he was, and he was just there to be a, in a perfect state. And he had a purpose there. But he failed because he loved something above God. Now, I'm not going to tell you to not love your wife and, and all that because there's pastors out there that'll tell you, there's a pastor out there that'll tell you that. I really don't want to name him, but anyway, so. Um, but anything that, become, be, that it be, uh, is between you and God will affect you on finding your purpose. If you love anything, whether it be a job, whether it be work, whether it be a school, whether it be a friend, whether it be a spouse, whether it be your family, if you put any of it before God, you won't be able to find your purpose. You won't be able to find your meaning. You won't be able to find out what God's will is for your life. And then let's look at another one kind of similar. Let's look at Judas. John chapter 12. Turn with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I forgot to look at my watch, so we're going all night. John chapter 12. And look at verse 4. John chapter, four John chapter 12, verse 4. The Bible says, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and, excuse me, bear, and bear what was put therein. And so in every gospel, you look, they have this account, but in every gospel, Jesus Christ doesn't name the person. He doesn't name the disciple. He just says, one of the disciples said, why aren't you giving this to the poor? But here in John, he names them. He says it's Judas. Judas Iscariot. And you might think you read that and you're like, oh wow, Judas, he wants to give the poor. He must be a nice guy. And then you read the very next verse. He didn't do it because he loved the poor. He did it because he was a thief. He had the love of money. The love of money. And we see that he loved money more than Jesus Christ because he betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. His master, his leader, his savior, he betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. And according to the Old Testament, that's the price of a slave. That's all he wanted. The price of a slave to betray his friend. For the love of money is the root of all evil. This ties in with the last one, but if you put money between you and God, you won't be able to fulfill your purpose. Imagine you're sitting in church and the Lord shows you, I want you to do this for me. And you tell the Lord, well, Lord, I have a job here. I'm making good money for a yearly salary. I have a good house. I have a good car. I, I can eat, my family is wearing nice clothes and all that. You lost your purpose. You lost your chance. And he'll say, okay, I'll go find someone else. There's plenty of people willing out there. Yeah, great. Yeah, amen. He's not going to beg on his knees. Yeah. No, please, please serve me. No, he'll just walk away. Yeah, yeah. There's many places in the gospel even when he was walking on the water, it says that he would have just kept walking if they didn't acknowledge him. Isn't that wild? He was walking on the water, not for the disciples, but since they cried out to him, he stopped and turned toward them. But he would just kept walking. He just would have kept walking. Those guys on the, uh, the way to Damascus, or uh, Dam what is that road? The, 
When he, Emmaus, yes, the road to Emmaus. Uh, when they're walking on that, it says he would have just kept walking past them if they didn't acknowledge him. He'll find someone willing if you're not willing. He'll give you a purpose. He'll show you, hey, I want you to do this. And then you have that chance. We heard it already. Immediately. You better take that chance. Or he'll go. He'll leave. And then, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 4. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. This is the main purpose of every human being that is born in this earth, on this earth. Revelation chapter 4, look at verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And we are, I, I, I believe Brother Jay, uh, he mentioned it in, uh, at the end of his message, just out of the blue, and he said that we all have a main purpose, and that's to glorify God. Yeah. And that, I, I'm, I totally agree with that, and according to this verse, that is very true. But in this message, I want you to personally think, I know you're all supposed to glorify God, but personally, why are you here? What is your purpose? Not, don't look at your wife. Yeah, yeah, don't look at your family. Right. Don't look at the person sitting next to you. Don't look at your pastor. Yep. You. Yourself. Yeah. And you're not going to find, I mean, maybe you will, but you're probably not going to find it here. You're going to have to search the scriptures. You're going to have to study the word of God. You're going to have to fall, be on your knees yeah. praying yeah. to find your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But each one of you here, if you're saved, you have a purpose. It's not just to sit in a church for, the re for your whole life and never tell the gospel. No, never tell anyone about Jesus Christ. That's not your purpose. You young men here, your purpose isn't to just go into, into sport. I'm not, none of this is bad. Get me, I'm, I'm saying that. None of this is bad. If you do this, that's not a bad thing. I like sports. But our purpose is not here on earth to get a scholarship and play sports and maybe get into the NFL or whatever. That's not our purpose. I doubt anyone here could get in the NFL. But, well, man, that's a... Anyways. But that's not our purpose. You young men here, what's your purpose? You young women here, what's your purpose? Is your purpose to go after you? Because there's a lot of young people in here that are coming up to a fork in the road, as we heard from Brother Sean, that you're coming to a fork in the road and you're going to have to decide, as, as Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Right. Amen. And one day, you're going to move out of your house, you're going to move, go to college, or maybe you'll, leave, uh, you'll be done with college, and then you'll have to make a decision. Right. Am I going to serve God, or am I going to serve the devil? Right. Is that your purpose? Not to be frank, but is that your purpose to end up in a ditch? Drunk? Is your purpose to overdose on drugs? It's sad. I've been in a lot of camps where there's people that were, that were sitting in the front row shouting and praising God and they overdose on drugs 20 years later. Like Sean said, some of you aren't even here. You're back wherever. You're back home. You're back on your phone, whatever. Your spirit's not here. What's your purpose? You got to find out. What's your meaning? So according to Revelation 4.11, every lost person in this entire world is not fulfilling their purpose. And you'll hear people, especially the, the, the Hollywood just over the hill, uh, <laughs> over that mountain or whatever, and, and uh, they'll be like, oh, my purpose is, is to act and, and be in the entertainment world, and, and my purpose is to be a famous singer and, and the scientist. My purpose is to do great things for the, the world and, and let's give to the poor and help the animals and all that. That's a purpose. That's not a purpose. It's not a purpose. That's why they all go crazy and sadly, that's why a lot of them commit suicide. They don't have a purpose. I got to go to the uh, Golden Gate Bridge with uh, some uh, members from Gino Kim's church and I, I researched about it 
It's the second most popular place in the world to commit suicide. Second. The first is, a, is a, on a bridge over a river in China. Why do they do it? They lose their purpose. They have no purpose. If you have no purpose, you have no meaning to live. You got to find it. It could save your life. It could save your ministry. It could save your relationship with Jesus Christ. You got to find it. Not only every lost person is not fulfilling their purpose, but every backslidden Christian is not fulfilling their purpose. Wow, come on. Yeah. They're not glorifying God. Amen. They're not doing what they're supposed that they were put on this earth to do. They weren't put on this earth to go and do drugs and go away from the Lord. They were put on this earth to glorify God. They're not fulfilling it. And then let's switch over and look at things that will help you find your purpose. So I'm like the uh, modern Christians. First negative and then positive. Okay. <laughs> Things that will help you find your purpose. Oh, thank you. We're going to look at Noah. Uh, Noah, in, uh, turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse 7. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 verse 7 the Bible says by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith the first few words are by faith this whole chapter is about faith why did Noah build a heart, an ark? Because he was moved with fear and by faith. He preached for a hundred years without a, probably without a cloud in the sky. And they didn't even know what rain was before that. And he was preaching that it was going to rain and no one even knew what rain was. That there was going to be a flood. And it came. He did it by faith. He fulfilled his purpose. His purpose in life was to build an ark and save his family and, re, and repopulate the earth. That was his purpose. And why, why was he able to fulfill it? Be by, because he had faith. Christian, to fulfill your purpose, to find your purpose, you're going to have to have faith. Like I said, you're probably not going to get it tonight. You might not even get it in any of these messages. But you have to have faith that God will give it to you one day. You have to have patience that Jesus Christ will show you one day. And that, that's a blessing. I mean, we, ha we saw that in PBI. It's a blessing to see someone that's eager to serve the Lord, and he just can't wait to go out. But you have to wait on the Lord. And if, if you're willing to go, if you're willing to do something for the Lord, He'll give you something to do. He'll give you a purpose. By faith, you've got to have faith. And then another thing, uh, another character is Joseph. Turn with me to Genesis 39, Genesis 39. Feels like I really killed the, uh, the damper, uh, the whatever, I don't know. Like you're all shouting and praising. I knew, I knew you guys wouldn't be, this is not a shouting message. So, I mean, seriously. Like, I've been in some messages where people are running around and stuff. This ain't, this ain't one of them. It's serious. It's serious. We all need it. Genesis chapter 39, look at verse 12. Don't have time to read the context, but we all know the chapter. Verse 12, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and fled, and got him out. If you want to find your purpose, if you want to find the meaning of your life, you have to flee fornication. The Bible says abstain from fornication. Flee youthful lusts. And I hope no one in here is, is committing fornication. But Jesus Christ said, if you lust in your heart after a woman, you've committed fornication. There's not one guy in here that's holy enough to say, I've never lusted after a woman. Not one. I'm just going to be frank with you. That, there's not one. <laughs> like, seriously. I'm not justifying it, of course. But we all, uh, according to that verse, 
we commit fornication in our heart. And something that is destroying the Bible-believing uh, movement and the, the King James Bible believer is a thing called pornography. And in Dr. Ruckman's day, he didn't have to preach about it. They were all in the magazines. You had to go to a store, wear a trench coat, and hide yourself, or go to the movie theaters and watch it, and you were ashamed. But now you, I don't have one with me, but now you got it on your phone. You just type a few words, you're there. It drains you spiritually. It drains you. You won't be able to find your purpose. Got to flee from it. Got to flee from it. I know it's not a good, I know it's not an easy thing to preach about, but you got to do it. You got to abstain from fornication. The Lord ain't going to bless it. And then another thing, another trait for Joseph to turn over uh, to Genesis 50. Genesis 50. Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph had a purpose. His purpose was, and he couldn't see that. That's the thing. Like He couldn't see back when he was in the pit and his brothers threw him in the pit and he couldn't see that he would be, that his brothers would be coming to him for food. He didn't see that. Lord didn't show him that. But he had faith and he fled fornication. Imagine if he would have committed fornication. Imagine what would have happened. He would have been thrown into jail. He might have even been killed. God would have killed him. He wouldn't have been blessed. But he kept his testimony and he went to jail for an unlawful cause and he became the second in hand ruler right under Pharaoh. And they came to him and he saved the whole land of Egypt because he fled from fornication. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 50 and look at verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. He's talking to his brothers. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. He saved a lot of people. He saved Jacob and his brothers because he, had the, he was able to interpret the dreams. We know the story. And he was able to store up in the seven years of plenteous and the seven years of drought. They were able to uh, survive. But what he does is he trusted God through the whole way. Trust God through all the troubles he went through. Imagine if your brothers betrayed you and wanted to kill you and instead they sold you into slavery. And then because you want to obey God and, obey and have a good testimony, you get thrown into jail through the whole thing. I don't, it's not recorded. Maybe he did. But through the whole time, he's, you don't see him complaining. You don't see him saying, why God? Why am I in here? I'm just trying to serve you. I'm just interpreting dreams that you've given me. He trusts God through the whole way. And the Lord blessed him. And Christian, you're going to have to trust God. You're going to have to trust God. Some people in here, God's going to give you a purpose and it might not be something that you want to do. But you're going to have to trust God that you can do it. Some, some people in here, God will call you to preach and, you, and you'll tell yourself, I can't preach. There's no way I can preach. There's no way I can do that. You got to trust God. You got to trust God. You got to do it. And then uh, another character is Moses. Moses. Look at Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. I'm flipping through a lot of pages so you guys keep stay awake. <laughs> Keeps you up, doesn't it? Yeah. Flipping through the pages. Unless you don't have a Bible, then you'll go right to sleep. <laughs> Exodus 4, and look at verse <clears throat> 10. Exodus 4, verse 10. The Bible says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. A lot of pastors here, they preach and they show that this is excuses that Moses made and I agree, but I also see it as Moses overcoming his fears. Because if you look later on, not too long, a couple chapters after, he's going before Pharaoh and he's telling them, you're going you're gonna to let the people go or this plague's going to happen. 
and then he goes across the Red Sea and he preaches to millions of people, the children of Israel. And he's a great speaker. He goes from saying, I'm illiterate, I can't speak, I'm slow of tongue, to being a great speaker. He overcame his fear. And if you want to find your purpose, if you want to have a purpose, you're going to have to overcome your fear. Like I said, you might have a fear of a stage fright. I had, I, when I first started preaching, I was, I was terrified of getting in front of people. I had to overcome that fear. I had to overcome it. You can't fulfill your purpose if you don't overcome your fears. And also, the same with Moses, is I see other than one thing, one thing, he was obedient to the Lord. Throughout his whole ministry, and it's so sad that he obeyed the Lord through his whole life, and then he made one mistake, and he wasn't allowed in the land. And Dr. Uggman says that the Lord did this because it's a perfect picture of salvation. You, brew, you uh, hit the rock the first time, Jesus Christ, they hit him at, the, at Calvary, but you don't hit him twice. That's what the Mass does every Sunday. They hit him over and over and over again. You have to speak to it. And that's why when he did that, he could not let him in the promised land. And even though Moses cried and, and said, please let me go, the Lord ended up saying, don't say this again. Don't pray this again. I said no. That's it. It's sad. It really is. A man that gave his life to living in the wilderness and was not able to go into the land of Canaan. But one day, as I heard from Brother Kim the other uh, day preaching, one day he's going to go back into that land. Yeah, and he got to go back, and he got to go and see a little bit of the land when he went on, landed on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, right. And he landed on that, and he's like, wow, <laughs> this is what I was missing out. Man. But one day he's going to go back, yes. and he's going to finish his ministry. Yeah. He's going to finish it. But he, oh, he was obedient to the Lord. You have to be obedient to the Lord. When the Lord tells you to do something, you have to be obedient to it. The verse, the second, I believe it's the second verse. The second verse that we had to learn, Romans 12, 2, am I right? The end of it says that there's a perfect and acceptable and good will of God, am I right? Amen. There's three wills of God. You start out on the perfect will of God. I don't think you guys can hear me. You start out on the perfect will of God and the Lord says, go this way. And you say, no, I'm going to go this way. And he says, okay, you're now in the acceptable will of God. And you're on the acceptable will of God, and you're doing good, and the Lord's using you. And then he says, go this way. He says, no, I'm going to go this way. Oh. Now you're in the good will of God. Oh, getting out of the camera. Now you're in the good will of God. Then if you get out of that, then you're completely out of the will of God. But you got three chances. I'm not, the Bible doesn't explain when you can get out of the will of God like that, when you can, but I've heard from preachers that say they were called, or I've heard from a guy, he said he was called to be a missionary at this age, and he didn't go. So then he, was in, he lived the rest of his life in the acceptable will of God. He served the Lord. He, he, he won souls of the Lord, but he wasn't in the perfect will of God. You have to be obedient to God. And then uh, let's look at Samuel. Turn over to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. This is a very important, they're all important, but this is a very important one to be able to find your purpose. 1 Samuel chapter 3, and look at verse 11. Or not 11. Um, sorry. 1 Samuel 3, verse 18. 1 Samuel 3, verse 18. The Bible says, And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Verse 21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Notice, he, he was given a message to tell Eli. And he was given a message to tell Eli that his sons were wicked and that God was going to kill them. And he, 
I, why, this is a young man. He's going to tell an older man, God is going to kill your boys. That's a hard thing to do. But it says he didn't let any words fall to the ground. He gave them everything. And if you look back at Moses, God told him in the, at the, the, fiery bu the, bush, uh, the fiery bush, he told him to go tell Pharaoh that I'm going to send, you're going to let my people go or I'm going to send a bunch of plagues and I will kill your son. What did Moses forget to say when he went before Pharaoh? He didn't say, I'm going to kill your son. He didn't. Not all his words. A few words fell to the ground. He didn't give the whole counsel of God. And according to Paul, we're to give, we're to preach the whole counsel of God. Young men, if you end up getting to be preachers, you preach the whole counsel Amen. of God. You don't let that leave anything out. No. Amen. There's a lot of negative things in this Bible, but you don't leave them out. There's too many positive, <laughs> effeminate, <laughs> whatever you want to call them, I'll tell you later, <laughs> that are preaching nothing but good things. I've been in the churches. All it is is positive thinking. They have a giant smile on their face and they're blinking their eyes. All it is is positive. You've got to preach the whole counsel of God. And then notice verse 21. It says, He was revealed this by what? By the word of the Lord. That means Samuel at a young age was in this book, studying it, pondering on it, reading it, and trying to find out his will. And he found his purpose because he was studying and reading what they had. They didn't have the Word of God, but what they had, the scrolls, what they had at that time, the commandments of Moses. He was studying the Word of the Lord. And if you want to find your purpose, you're going to have to study the book. You're going to have to study the Bible. You're going to have to look in the Bible. If I was, back when I was in the Amazon and, and I decided, hey, I don't want to read my Bible this morning, I wouldn't have found my purpose. Maybe the Lord would have showed me later or maybe he would have left. It, it, it scares me. It really does. Because I've skipped some days. Well, I've skipped a lot of days of reading my Bible. What if I would have skipped that day when the Lord showed me I want you to be a missionary here. Yeah. How about that? That's good, brother. What if the day you skip, the yeah. Lord had your purpose oh, in that chapter? Wow, that's good. And then he said, and then you read it again and it's completely gone. Wow. Oh, I can read that I can read that same verse over and over again. It's not the same to me as it was that time. Oh, that's, that's good. But you read over and over it again, and the Lord will say, Okay, you had your you had your chance. You didn't take it immediately. You got to find your purpose through the Word of God. And then another one is Elisha. Elisha, look at, over at 1 Kings. I know there's a lot of them, but we're Bible believers, so. First, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And <clears throat> look at verse 19. This explains what you should be doing to find your purpose. What you should be doing to find your purpose. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with the twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he went, he with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. That was his calling. That was Elijah. He's about to be raptured out in the chariot of fire. And that was Elijah saying, here it is. Here's my ministry. Take it over. What was he doing? Plowing the field. He was just doing what he was supposed to do every day. He was just doing his job. He wasn't in a revival. He wasn't in a camp meeting. He wasn't even in church. And he found his purpose. Just plowing the field. Wherever you're at, San Jose, uh, Ontario, San Diego, you just plow your field. Amen. And then one day, God will come down and He'll throw your, His mantle on you <laughs> and say, I want you to do this. That's good. You don't have to be in a revival to get your purpose, right. to find your purpose. You could just be at your job and the Lord says, 
I want you to do this. You could just get up faithfully every morning before you go to work, early in the morning before the sun's even up, reading your Bible and just read a verse that gives you your purpose. Just doing any ordinary thing. You don't have to go to the mission field and say, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a missionary here. I'm going to go all over the world and, and just wherever the Lord, wherever I have a great feeling, that's where I'm going to be a missionary. No. You just do whatever the Lord tells you to do. Every day. Not only did he do that and was able to find his purpose, but look at 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. Second Kings chapter 3 and look at verse 11. Second Kings chapter 3 verse 11. The Bible says, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king, is, king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which, what? Poured water on the hands of Elijah. Yes, sir. How about that? What a humbling thing. Yes, sir. Elijah's doing all these miracles. He's chopping heads off of Baalites and he's doing all these great things and yes, fire's coming down on the altar. You know what Elisha's doing? Here you go, Elisha. Yeah. Or here you go, Elijah. How can I help you? Yeah, amen. Wow. yeah, maybe some pastors will use this to show that you're like, you're a servant to your pastor and all yeah. that, but just pour, pour in their hand. Pour in. It's humility. He had to humble himself to do that. He could have said, man, I, I want to be able to do these miracles. I want to be able to raise the dead. I want to be able to call fire down upon. And notice, notice what chapter this is in. This is before all the miracles that he did. This is before everything happened. And he was able to call fire down. The first, he had to pour water and he had to humble himself. Pour water on the prophet's hands. On the man of God poured on his hands. Christian, if you want to find your purpose, you're going to have to do it through humility. Yes, sir. The first point was that pride will keep you from your purpose, but humility will bring you to your purpose. Like I said, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You humble yourself and you say, Lord, I can't be a preacher. I can't be a missionary. I can't be a servant for you. But if you allow me to do it, I'm willing. Humility. God's like, huh, I could use him. Then there's a guy over here. Man, I just got out of Bible college. I can preach. I'm the greatest preacher ever. And I can just, I'm going to light the, fire, the world on fire. And God's like, I'll just give them, give them some trouble, maybe humble them. Yes, sir. See in a few years, maybe see in a few years, I'll come back to them. Yeah. Lose some years doing that. Wow, that's Pride. Great. That's good. That's good. Lord will have to throw some trouble. Could be 10 years, it could be 15 yeah. until you humble yourself or until God humbles you. That's good. And then God can finally use you. He says, okay, now here's your purpose. Here's something to do. And last of all, let's look at David, 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12. This is the chapter we all know, 2 Samuel 11. Uh, David committed the sin with Bathsheba. And here uh, Nathan goes before Nathan the prophet goes before him, tells him the story of the the ewe lamb and, and David gets mad and he says, well, I'm going to kill the guy. And, and then Nathan says, points his finger at him and says, Behold, uh, thou art the man. And look at verse 13 of chapter 12. We all know it. It's a famous verse. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. David messed up. It doesn't tell you how long it took for Nathan to come. Could have been a year. Could have been a few months. But it said the very last verse of, 27, of chapter 11, it says, David had done 
Uh, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And for the longest time, David didn't even acknowledge that he was wicked, that he was a sinner. And then he killed Uriah. He didn't even acknowledge it until God sent a prophet to him. And then he humbled himself. And he repented. We're all sinners in here. The Bible says the just man falls seven times and riseth up again. We're going to fall. It's just a matter of time. We're going to fall. Hopefully it's not where we fall completely out of the race, but we're going to fall. But we have to get back up. Satan wants to keep you down. He wants you to stay down. And he'll use Christians and he'll use your family to say, no, you, just, you, just, you, just, you messed up too bad. You messed up too bad. You can't come back. But God says, come on. Come on, I want you back. Get back up. Come on, keep moving. Let's go. I got a pur- you, you got a purpose. You need to do it. You haven't done it yet. You fell. You got to find it. But to find your purpose, you need, when you do fall, you have to repent. His blood will cleanse us of all sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He'll forgive us. He'll repent. 